Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome. So let's just get started. So today's session is organized by the Foundation for Developing Compassion Wisdom, FDCW. And we're a nonprofit dedicated to a kinder, wiser, and more compassionate world. And my name is Victoria Coleman. I'm the executive director of FDCW. Today's session is going to last for 60 minutes. FDCW offers courses, training, and resources for developing a warm heart and a wise mind. Our content is rooted in ancient wisdom of Buddhist philosophy and psychology, as well as modern psychology and sciences of the mind, such as neuroscience. Our approach uncovers a deeper understanding of our mind, our inner world, and our outer reality, and how these are all interconnected. Last year, we featured six events on compassion and how we can integrate compassion into different aspects of our lives. But this year, we're focused on wisdom and the mind. By understanding our own mind more deeply, we can develop a compassionate and caring attitude towards others, an attitude that can become stable and unwavering. How do we go about understanding how our mind works? Well, advice from the founder of Universal Education, from Lama Thupten Yeshe, was collected in a book called Becoming Your Own Therapist. And here is this wonderful book, which has inspired us today. This is available from the Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive for free. So Lama advised us, be wise, treat yourself, your mind, sympathetically with loving kindness. If you're gentle with yourself, you will become gentle with others. So don't push yourself. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said, we have to find a way to relax the mind. If we can do this, consideration and compassion arise naturally. But we also need to find ways to reinforce these skills. If we create space, the mind can relax. This is important because when the mind is anxious and restless, we can't use our intelligence clearly. So we felt inspired to explore this topic of mind and wisdom in more depth. How does understanding our mind more deeply bring us more compassion in our lives? So we came up with a series of six events this year to explore mind, wisdom, and our emotions. And I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted that Venerable Rubina Curtin has so kindly agreed to launch our Wisdom Dialogue series. And today she's going to speak on the topic of becoming your own therapist. I've had the privilege of knowing Venerable Rubina for more than 20 years now. She's written and edited many books on Buddhism and the mind. She delivers podcasts. She ordained as a nun in 1978, and she's worked as an editor at Wisdom Publications and at Mandala Magazine. She teaches all over the world with an almost non-stop teaching schedule, and she has pioneered bringing Buddhist teachings to prisoners all over the world. There's a film made about her life called Chasing Buddha, and she also has the most beautiful singing voice. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to hearing from Venerable Rubina on how we can understand our own mind better and become our own therapist. Over to you, Venerable. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I, I use always this uh, picture in the back of my thing, but the trouble is it's Zoom. So everything's back to front. I'm back to front, but the Buddha's back to front. So, which is not auspicious, probably. I have to reverse the picture. I've never bothered to do, but I should do it. So pretend Buddha's the other way around, okay? You don't know the difference with me, so there you go. Oh, no, because i got my robes the same as Buddha, you see. Anyway, that was a side. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Let me have a look at you all. I don't want to look at myself. There we go. So be your own therapist. We got that from Lama, you know. We got that from Lama Yeshi. Uh, and it's such, it's sort of, a, it's like a cute, it's like cute, it's like a good marketing, but it's the most perfect statement of what a Buddhist is, actually. You know, it's very interesting. I mean, um, you know, Victoria mentioned compassion, and indeed compassion is there. There's this two wings, a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. I speak, I say it repeatedly. So it's a way of framing all of the Buddhist teachings. And it is, if you like, it is finally the point. But as His Holiness says, compassion is not enough. You need wisdom. As Lama Zopa says, even more pointedly, meaning well is not enough. We need wisdom. So... Uh, so that means we have to understand what this is. So first of all, it sounds a bit abstract. We don't go around saying, I want to get some wisdom. It means you've got to go and learn a lot of math or something, you know? Not, it's not like that. I mean, it's, and it's an interesting point because I know in 
um, in our own world, when we think of wisdom, it's kind of, you either think of a little old, an old man, probably usually, I mean, whatever, wise, you know, somehow kind of wisdom comes with old age, we think, we're going to wait till we get it when we're old. Well, thank you very much. This is, it's not quite the, the way Buddha talks, but what's fascinating, we can, uh, we can admire wisdom. And I think in our culture, you know, in the, certainly in the philosophical materialist world, and I was not being sarcastic as a fact, where that, where that, where that philosophy prevails, um, the highest of our, you know, the ones we most revere on this planet are those who've got a lot of wisdom. So that would mean a mathematician, that would mean a, a physicist, you know. We can maybe admire philosophers, but they usually, we just think they're living in their heads probably. But uh, maybe even a psychologist, a neuroscience, definitely, a neuroscientist. So it's sort of like the hard sciences. Or even maybe we could say, like a, my, perhaps a brilliant musician, we admire. But the wisdom one is really fascinating. We can admire the best physicist on the planet, but we know very well in our world that has nothing to do with ethics. You can be wise in, in physics, but still go home and beat up your husband every day, you know? Whereas the Buddhist view, it is totally not like that. Meaning well is not enough. Compassion is not enough. We need wisdom. So we, that means we must understand. Because actually, the, the finally, the point is compassion, our ability to be of benefit to others, empathy with the suffering of others, and then the proactive action, the proactive energy of compassion, what can I do to help? That's the point. That's the body touch with path. Absolutely. But wis wisdom, you're limited by your, by, by your, the extent of your wisdom is, is the extent of your compassion. So it's crucial to understand what wisdom is in order to really have profound compassion, you know. So if we use an example of, a, you know, the bodhisattvas, the holy beings. So let's just say we can use the example of the Dalai Lama because in the world he's known, he's revered. Somehow he's one of the best examples, isn't he? He's the best proof of the pudding of Buddha's teachings, as we'd say in England. Proof of the pudding. I don't think that in America. The proof of the pudding. He is the one. There's no doubt about it. So what's interesting is we can see we can what's evident is compassion. But if anybody listens to his teachings and he's you know he's revered among all the other Buddhists, the, the Tibetan, the, the scholars, the greatest scholars as the top scholar. But what's interesting even now is isn't it fascinating? It lasts 20, 30 years more. His amazing discussions with all the brains of the West, you know, and they are really finding they're humbled by discovering he's not just a nice person. He's got this super super sharp mind and people are really now beginning to understand the wisdom aspect of the of the buddhist body of knowledge it goes back more than three thousand years you know i mean there's no there's no doubt so that's what's really interesting in the west now people finding discovering this extraordinary body of knowledge that's in that um you know in the um in the east i mean as Holmes Dalai Lama himself said one time it was that these amazing indians more than three thousand years ago actually who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self i mean big surprise to us i always joke we probably thought it was Freud 100 years ago, don't we? So the wisdom part is massive. But what does it mean by wisdom? What's that got to do with anything? What's it got to do with my happiness, in other words? And how can it inform our compassion? How can it enable us to have phenomenal compassion? Well, this is where we have to understand the Buddhist model of the mind. I mean, we, we all, we love, a lot of people love being a Buddhist. They love the idea of mindfulness. They love to do meditation. They love, you know, the love. And many people enter into a spiritual path, enter into Buddhism on the basis of compassion. We, you know, we all know you'd love to more compassion, more wisdom, not so sure, you know, because we don't have a, so the, what's the Buddha's take on it? Well, this is the interesting point. One way of framing the whole of the Buddhist path is in terms of stopping suffering and getting happiness. Forgetting the compassion wing, okay, for oneself. And that's the Four Noble Truths. As Buddha's presentation from his own direct experiential findings, one, what is suffering, two, the causes of it, three, you can be free of suffering and its causes, and four, the methodology, how to do it. That's that's the that's that's the wisdom wing. So how would you be if you did that? How would you be if you discovered what suffering was, you found the causes, you did the work and rid your mind of the causes, therefore of suffering? how would you be this is this is this is the wisdom wing compassion wings is, is another whole kettle of fish you know this is the work you do on yourself this is the nuts and bolts of the teachings if you're studying the tibetan buddhist path in the gilukpas for example our, you know the tradition that i'm educated in and his holiness and my, our lamas my lamas lamas over lama yeshi you would you know you would study this packaging called the lam rim this gradual path and the first stages of it 
you know, they, they divide into three levels, and I like to call them junior school, high school, and university. I mean, it's, it's kind of cute, but it's, it's it's helpful. Junior school and high school, that's the wisdom we, and that's, they're the practices and teachings, and that's the four noble truths that we share with the Theravadan path, the teachings we share with the Hinayana, the Theravadan path. They're all the same teaching. They're Lord Buddha's teachings on how to put you together. So in all this level of practice has got nothing to do with proactively being kind, being compassionate. That's the wisdom. That's the compassion wing. That's the Mahayana component. This first level is all about knowing yourself deeply, intimately, you know, but the very first level is not even the mind. The very first level is control the servants of the mind. Be a nice person. Don't kill. Don't steal. This little, you know, Buddha would exhort us this little list of 10 don'ts. The first seven are about the body and speech. He shares this with any decent person on the planet. A good communist would not kill a nigh and steal. A good Christian, a good Muslim, your grandmother would tell you. So this is the very first level of practice. You know, you, you, you control the servants of your mind. The mind is the point, but you've first got to control the servants of your mind. And if you look at the world, it's completely evident. I mean, it might be the mind that has the anger in it, but what does the harm? It's the fist and the mouth. It's clear. Look at the world. So the first level of practice, and we often don't think of it this way, but it's really quite profound and quite logical. You've got to calm your energy down, discipline, discipline your body, discipline your speech. And the very first level is at least don't harm others. Then you get to the, then you get, which, um, why? Because they're the actions that are driven by the neurotic parts of your mind. Now you get to high school, the middle scope, the, the next stages of the wisdom wing. And now you really get into the nitty gritty of being a Buddhist. Now you learn to be your own therapist. Now you learn to really get wisdom. So it's very clear what that means when we understand the Buddhist approach to the mind. So essentially he's saying, we've got, we can divide the contents of our mental consciousness. We have our sensory consciousness, which is really limited in its capacity for cognition. But we give pow much power to our bodies, don't we? So if we get the sensory consciousness, we've got the mental consciousness. And as Lama Zoparimite puts it, that's where the workshop is. That's where the thoughts and feelings and emotions and concepts and opinions and ideas and viewpoints and, and, and you know, all the, all the thoughts about math and music and intellectual stuff and emotions and feelings and anger and compassion and love and despair and subtle, subtle levels, instinct, intuition, the whole entire spectrum of our inner being. That's where the workshop is. That's the mental consciousness. And that is what we have to learn to work with and learn to unpack and unravel in order very simply so okay that's what we have to do so what do we have to do well that means we have to understand the content so he divides all this massive soup of emotion in here super thoughts and feelings and emotions he divides them all into th buddha into three categories of states of mind it's not how we talk in modern science absolutely not they got the neurotic deluded afflicted unhappy you know lama yeshi has endless synonyms for these which we for states of mind, which we are intimately familiar with. Attachment, anger, low self-esteem, arrogance, jealousy, pride. We know these words intimately. And the Buddha is telling us that these are the main voices, all these other expressions of the root emotional affliction, as they would call it in Buddhist psychology, affliction, the root delusion, the root neurotic state of mind that's so primordial, so subtle, so primordial, so kind of absolute in a sense, in the way it drives everything, and that it underpins everything and really hard to get to. The final wisdom is when we uproot that one. But before that, we listen, we try to calm down the voices, the main voices of they know this this root one is called ego grasping. This is a misconception about the very nature of oneself. This is the real stuff of the wisdom teachings in Buddhism. But the, the, the initial stages are learning to become intimately familiar with your own mental consciousness. So the first category are all these neurotic ones, and we are very familiar with these. The next lot, there are virtues. These are our saving grace, love, compassion, wisdom, kindness, generosity, forgiveness. We know these intimately as well. Now, the third lot, I like to call them the mechanical parts of our mind. These are the parts that enable you to function, whether you're a murderer or a meditator. To be a good murderer, you've got to have good concentration, good mindfulness, good attention. These are necessary qualities, good discrimination. If you shoot the wrong person, you'll be in trouble. 
you, they're the mechanical bits of the mind. They're neither neurotic or deluded, nor are they virtuous, but they're crucial pieces of part of our mind. So we forget those for now. We're interested in these first two lots. So the Buddha's point is this. The neurotic ones, the deluded ones, the afflicted ones, they're the unhappy ones, the painful ones, and they are the source of our own pain, and therefore the, the source of why we harm people with our body and speech. It's not a, this is not a difficult concept, but it, it's like almost deceptively simple. It seems like that's too easy. How can you say all suffering comes from these deluded states of mind? That's Buddha's analysis. That's his presentation, you know? which is kind of outrageous. So then the next lot, the virtues, they are the source of our happiness. They are the source of our happiness. So one way of putting the entire Buddha's path, even before we get to the final wisdom, is to lessen the neurotic ones and grow the good ones. Guess what, you know? But we're looking focused here, particularly on lessening the neurotic ones, because this is the first stages of practice in the wisdom wing. So, so what will be the results of your doing that? How would you benefit from that? There are two ways. One is, guess what? You become less neurotic, less depressed, less angry, less jealous, less suffering, more happy, more fulfilled, more content, quite literally. But the crucial piece, so you begin that, you get more contentment, but the crucial piece is, because these neurotic states of mind have the very specific function, apart from being the source of your pain, apart from being deeply disturbing to you, they have this other function, which is quite unique to the Buddhist view. And until we understand this, we can't say we really understand Buddha's approach. They, they, are, they cause us to not, they cause us to be not in touch with reality. And, that, and that's not some cosmic thing in the sky, reality. Reality is just how things are. And why is that? Because they distort. That's their key function. These neurotic states of mind, they, they, they're called also delusions. That's a brilliant word in English. You know, in I mean, I think in some languages, you know, Italian and Spanish, it's not a very, not a very kind of, it's not a word that's used, but in English it's delicious. And it really hits the nail on the head. The Buddha's telling us the extent to which I'm caught up in attachment and anger, let's say just two, is one, the extent to which I'm miserable and therefore harm others, but two is the extent to which I am not in touch with the reality of whether it, whatever it is that I'm attached or angry with. And it's not complicated when I'm super attached to chocolate cake meaning emotionally needy for it, can't stop thinking about it, believe that when I get it, I'll get happy. All of this anyway is not, is not wisdom, is ignorance, Buddha says, but the key function of the attachment, being a delusion, being emotional affliction, but having this delusional component, what it does quite literally is exaggerate, distort, embellish the deliciousness of the cake. And it causes the cake, we know this, to appear, as Lama Zopra puts it, to appear back to us as divine, delicious, and definitely when I eat it, I'll get happy. So in other words, when you're, when you're seeing the chocolate cake or your handsome boyfriend through the lenses of attachment, you are literally not seeing reality. You're not seeing as they really are. You're distorting. The attachment exaggerates the beauty of the boyfriend. It blinds you from seeing anything else, not in a useful way. Because it's, it's rooted in, in 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 emotional hunger, and then you and then it, and then it, you and then this attachment causes you to manipulate to get the boyfriend to only do what you want, which is the driving force of attachment. So it's 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 riddled with lies within it. It's like itself is a lie, a misconception, and then because it's so habitual, it causes everything out there to be distorted. We're not literally not in touch with reality, and the and of course the other aspect of it is it's totally self-centered. It's totally self-centered. So then when we're living mainly when when attachment and anger and fears and jealousy and anxiety predominate, one you are utterly miserable. And you are locked, you are locked away from others. There's no sense of connectedness. There's no sense of empathy for others because you're so overwhelmed by your own misery, your own pain, because you we're leaving in these conceptual stories. This is why we suffer and this is why we harm others. And this is why our compassion is limited. So wisdom, meaning common sense, is what you get 
as and when you lessen attachment and anger and fears and jealousy, which is the first hard, hard work, and you can do that because they're distorted conceptions, and that's the hard part to see, these emotions, which is the level we function at, are driven by at a deeper level by conceptual stories. Because in this mental consciousness of ours, it's full of thoughts, feeling, thoughts and ideas, which and some have an emotional component. So Buddha would say some of these conceptual stories are valid because they are in touch with reality, such as love and compassion. They're in touch with reality. What does that mean? It means that when you, you know, reality for the Buddha is that things are interdependent. Things exist interdependently. Things function interdependently. And we know that even just with a computer, if all the bits and pieces that make up a computer are all doing their job properly, the, the computer functions. But as soon as one bit is out of whack, the whole computer doesn't, is, is a mess. Well, look at human beings. If you've got a relationship, and you fail, you learn to be patient, not always, you know, not always to follow your attachment and your anger, forgive the other person, be generous. That means your the relationship will be more harmonious. All the bits and pieces will work nicely. But as soon as your attachment or your anger or your anxiety predominate, it's like everything's out of whack because they are not in touch with interdependence. They all are rooted in this utter belief, which is very subtle, that there is an intrinsic me that's real from its own side, real chocolate cake, real boyfriend, real this, real that out there. N reality is not like that, Buddha says. So wisdom is you when you loosen the grip of these unhappy states of mind, one, you get less neurotic, you become more happy, that's the bonus. But two, you become more clear. You're more, there's a sense of connectedness to others. Therefore, your compassion and your empathy and your love can be far, can grow and grow and grow because the I is getting out of the way. So wisdom is what you get as you lessen neurotic things as well as get happiness because you become more clear and more interconnected with others. Now, because compassion and love and the virtuous states of mind are rooted, in, conventionally speaking, are rooted in the reality of dependent arising. The delusions are the opposite of dependent arising. The delusions are kind of eye-based, static, concrete, panic-stricken, ridiculous, out of whack with reality, are, are the source of pain, you know? Someone's chatting away there. Maybe now it's time to chat away. I've only talked for 25 minutes, but I think this is the start. Now I need you to ask me questions. Come on, you people. This is the, the essence of it. This is the essence of the Buddhist path. As you, So that's why compassion without wisdom isn't enough, because, and we can discuss that as well this one, briefly. So when, right now when we have compassion, let's just say you've got compassion for your alcoholic brother. You do. You do have compassion. You see his suffering. You do love him. You do want him to be happy. That's the definition of um, Christine. Can you can you unmute Christine? Mute yourself, Christine, darling. Esola, mute yourself. That's it. Thanks, Rita. So when you've got compassion for your brother, you are compassionate. But what you don't see, and this is this is really we could spend hours on this. What you don't realize is you because you've got attachment, and the bottom line with attachment is this emotional hunger that only wants everything to be lovely. It's quite brutal to say it that way, but it, and it only wants what I want. Well, from the attachment point of view, from the ego point of view, your brother's upsetting your apple cart. How dare he be an alcoholic and make me upset? So your attachment gets upset and turns into aversion. Now that pollutes your compassion pollutes your compassion because attachment sticks its nose in where it doesn't belong. And it's like a busybody. And you think you're being compassionate, telling your brother go to AA and all this, and you talk about him behind his back and you get upset with him and you blame him for making mum and dad unhappy. But attachment is the problem there, not your compassion. You think he's causing you suffering. He is not causing you suffering. What's causing you suffering is your attachment and your aversion. This is a really powerful point to make. So your compassion is limited, is polluted by your own attachment and aversion. So as you work on the wisdom wing and lessen attachment, lessen aversion, lessen jealousy, lessen the neuroses, you become far more peaceful, far more clear and more wise, and your compassion can be far more profound. But your compassion then is driven by wisdom. A bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So that's the essence of what I wanted to say. Now I think it's your time for questions. Let's discuss now, okay? Let's have a discussion. So thank you, Rubina. I have a question. So I, I have a friend and she is a mother and she worries. She, she, she suffers a lot from anxiety. Um, and she was yes. describing to me how 
she's worried about what's happening to her children and what can go wrong and she's, she's thinking about all these okay. things that can go wrong and I, and it struck me that her mind is sort of stuck in this like story of what can go wrong and I was trying to think how do I help her chat you know overcome those kind of mental afflictions do you have any advice on that well you know it's just it's, that's just a, a perfect an example it's a symptom from the Buddhist analysis, it's a symptom of the problem, which is attachment. I mean, this sounds so cute in the West. We don't think, it just sounds silly. So we've got to understand what Buddha means by it. Attachment is this primordial. First of all, it's, it's dissatisfaction. That's one of its key, its key uh, functions. We, we, get, we get born with this, a feeling that I am not enough and things aren't enough. Things aren't enough and even I'm not enough. And then attachment is then manipulate to try to get things to be the way we want them so it tries to manipulate people and things and sounds and smells and taste to be the way that i want and then it's also this emo therefore this emotional hunger that's always wanting things to be a certain way but the, so the way um anxi anxiety is you know is attachment out of control worrying about what might happen worrying if only this didn't happen that didn't happen it's always not satisfied attachment is never satisfied and when it's uncontrolled it, it manifests as this anxiety but what's interesting for some other people it manifests as anger so in a sense anxiety is a milder version of distressed attachment so anger is a volatile version because attachment's never happy attachment's never satisfied always wants things to be a different way always thinks things should be a different way and then so then when you've got more volatile personality then when things aren't the way attachment wants you get angry you shout and yell but the quieter people don't shout and yell you just get anxious if only this if only that because it's, it's the function it's the nature of attachment to be dissatisfied and it's sort of like it's busybody it's never stopping blah 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 blah. you know we know that and also it's it's, it's sometimes when it's um it's got multi it's got it's multifaceted in its function but anxiety and anger are more volatile and more mild expressions of thwarted attachment or, or and the other aspect of attachment is never stopping chat 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 we can't control it we can't control the endless thoughts i mean all that's doing is giving the analysis of the problem but i think like anything if you can't locate the problem how can you find the solution so this is the buddhist analysis you know, easygoing words of the problem of attachment. And everybody on the planet, the monkeys and dogs and ants, we are all driven by it. Lama said, I can tell you, Lama Yeshi, I can tell you about attachment for one whole year. We will never begin to understand it. So it's the natural way we all are, all according to um, our personalities, you know. So, uh, the, so that we've got to sort of, there's one there's so many approaches victoria one approach is when we can hear intellectually how it's functioning then when we can hear that it's a bunch of conceptual stories i mean if your friend wrote everything down that she was thinking or if somebody who's angry wrote down every thought they were having you'd have this really like a clear narrative of the absurdity of these states of mind and basically what the buddha is saying is they're exaggerations they're distortions they're inventions because we know with anxiety when it's really extreme you know you, you can you imagine rapists around the corner you imagine your daughter's going to get killed and you're going to, this is going to happen you, you imagine the worst dire things we can hear it's made up we can hear we make it up i mean the reality of impermanence is things could happen your daughter could die you know the, the house could collapse you know, an earthquake could come. This is true. This is impermanence. But so, and we always say, well, worrying about it doesn't help. It's easy to say that, but it's literally, that's the point. Because attachment can't stand the idea of difficult things, of bad things. I mean, you don't ever, I never hear a person say, I can't stop thinking good things all the time. That doesn't worry us. It's only all the, Im all the imagined bad things. So we all understand it. It's painful, but when you, sometimes I think giving this analysis, when you can hear the way the delusions are distorted, then one of the most basic ways to practice is to argue with them. It's not going to go away overnight. Anger doesn't go away overnight. Anxiety won't go away overnight. But there's a multitude of ways of listening to the to conceptual stories and realizing their distortions, their inventions, quite literally. So we have to work, argue with them work with them and then find other methods you know to settle ourselves like have a good practice all sorts of things i mean it's not that simple but when we can hear the fundamental problem these neurotic states of mind running rampant i don't know victoria i hope that's a bit useful 
Yeah, that is useful. Else? Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, I think Ariella has a question. Would you like to go, Ariella? Good, Ariella. Talk to me. Good evening, Venerable. Good to yes. see you. Um, yes. In regards to the delusions that you're saying and the neurotic feelings and, and the merry-go-round and round and round, uh, I feel that I go two steps forward and then something tiny happens and then I go 10 steps back. Um, right. um, and I always have the and I always have a good excuse why I should be upset. People don't do things the way they should be done and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I find myself again alone, right. rottening right. in my own anger, delusions, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, so et cetera. So my, question question? Is, my question is, again, mm -hmm. what to do in that moment when, you, you, when you're starting to fall or you already felt okay. and instead of lying around in the mud and in the shit, how darling. to immediately so, get okay. up and leave? No, darling, it's not like, it's, that's a bit like asking me, <clears throat> what will I do? when I'm driving 100 miles an hour on the freeway and my wheels are falling off? Well, the best answer is damage control at that point. And if, and the only re this is the point now. So if you're going to, if you, if you have a miracle, if a miracle occurs and you survive that, this is what, what you're talking about is then you curse yourself, you scream, you yell, how dare I'm bad. I'm hopeless. I failed again. That's an utter waste of time, Ariella. There's a series of misconceptions in what you've, in the very question you ask. The fact of the matter is it's too late to notice that you're angry when you're already being angry. It's, that's like, it's too late to notice the wheels are falling off. What you have to learn, the learning from that is to go back to basics, to be humble, to realize we've got to learn to have a technique every day. We have to learn to be able to meditate, become aware of our mind, make determination every evening, every morning. I'm going to watch my speech like a hawk, forget your mind, watch the servant of my mind, the, the speech, every day you begin to harness your speech. You might be feeling angry, but you don't vomit the words out. This is already a tremendous practice, Ariella. Every, and then second, every day. So in other words, you begin to notice the wheels wobbling. You don't just wait till you want to scream. And that's what comes from noticing your mind, from having a daily practice. It just takes time. So the other fundamental misconception in your question is that the there's an assumption that you should be better than you are. So that's like cursing and screaming at yourself because the wheels are falling off. No, you learn from it. I need to start to watch the wheels when they wobble. So that means when you're washing the dishes and you start to see your mind getting slightly irritated, that's mild anger. You grab it there. You don't wait till you want to kill your husband. You, you, you notice it and you because it's small, you're able to catch it and argue with it. Relax, Ariella. It's only the dishes. It doesn't matter. When you practice on the small things in your mind and even before that when you make everyday decisions and commitments to control the speech then you start to get a handle on your practice and then eventually it'll never get to the point where the wheels fall off but it's long term sweetheart are we communicating absolutely thank you so much thank you and don't have false expectations of your progress any little time of progress you make you rejoice that's Thank so, you. so important, Ariella. Thank you, darling. Thank you, Venerable. Hello, Mary. Mary, sweetheart. Is that Mary? That's not Mary. That's Hillary. There it is. Hillary, talk to me. Hello, Venerable. Thank you so much for your teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just got back from a trip to um, Nepal with my mother. And, what? you know, I was around, you know, the main uh, Budnath stupa. And um, I so... As I'm walking around the stupa and I'm saying the mantras, it occurred to me that um, I I'm ignorant about the meaning, the, the true. Um, I believe in in the in mantras, but to be honest, I don't really understand how they work. How these saying these these syllables? Okay, darling, it's not complicated. It's completely not complicated. Um, uh, do you do you accept that words? In general, words are an expression of what's in your mind. Would you accept that? Yes. Words are expressions of thoughts, aren't they? Yes. Aren't they? So what's in the mind, and then you speak it, that's a word. So the word 
love is an expression. If you're saying I love, and if it is a, that's a word that expresses a feeling in your mind. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. So if you were to consciously every day practice thinking I want to love everybody, may I love everybody, may people be happy, that will have an effect on your mind. Would you agree? Yes. You're programming your mind in love, aren't you? Would that's you agree right. with that? Yes. Because karma is everything you think produces that result in your mind. So if you think every day, I hate everybody and anger, how dare this world be the way it is? I hate the world, anger, anger, anger. Guess what you're programming your mind in? You're not surprised if you become an angry, ugly person, right? You're not surprised, right? Right. So anything can you be agree. a mind. You agree. you agree? No, no, wait. I'm not even saying that. Wait. Do you agree yeah. with what I said? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, a mantra is happens to be Sanskrit. That's all. It's a foreign language. And it happens to be, you don't have to accept this, but I'm saying it from all the from the from the point of view of all the, 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 the Buddhist masters and the literature, Sanskrit is a very particularly powerful blessed sound. I mean, all words are sound and they're particularly powerful sounds. But forget even that. These mantras are just Sanskrit for different psychological qualities that you're trying to cultivate. So when you, you know, you mightn't speak. Sanskrit, but if you do accept that, you know, Om Mani Pemi Hung is the sounds, the syllable sounds that represent love and compassion, and then you're saying them, you're having the thought of love and compassion in your mind, then guess what your mind will become? It's hardly rocket science. Sure. Well, That's I guess, I mean. yeah, thank you. I guess I understood a little more than I realized. Um, That's, that's right. There's nothing, okay. nothing mystical. Oh, yeah. Whatever you, th I mean, the Buddhist view of karma, fundamentally, whatever we think and do and say is the process of, pr of producing who we become. So if you're buying into Om Mani Pemi Hung being compassion or Om Sanadi being wisdom or this particular, even these different Buddhas, they represent different psychological qualities. You're buying into that, you become that you, you're then identifying with that. It's just part of the process that you develop in yourself. Yes. If you, you know, if you look at Hitler every day and enjoy what Hitler says and repeat his words, guess what you're going to become like? It's not rocket science. Mm. You understand? I do. That's, that's it. That's the meaning. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, darling. Hello, Nancy. Hello. How are you? Good. Think, well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious about fear. Uh, as I understand it, fear is on the anger spectrum. I'm, I'm hearing, I, just, I missed some of your words, Nancy. Okay, I'm, I'm curious about fear. As fear. I understand it, fear is on the anger yeah. spectrum. That's a very, no, that's a very interesting question. I just, all I can do is give you the Buddhist analysis. So what's fascinating, like we take this view, like I mentioned before, the Buddhist division of all the different thousands of thoughts and feelings and emotions into the neurotic, delusional, I-based states of mind, the valid, appropriate, virtuous, positive ones, and then there's other lot I talked about before, the mechanical bits, then the, the unhappy ones are all rooted in fear. They're, they are all, fear is their nature. Fear is their character. Look at anxiety. It's just mild fear. Now, what's very interesting you should say about anger, when you see a person yelling and shouting, we say, oh, look at that. They're just angry. But actually, they're having a serious mental breakdown, aren't they? As if the whole world has collapsed. Screaming. When I was little and my, and my sister Janet was mean to me, I'd run to my mother as if the whole world had collapsed. Mommy, mommy, Janet said this. As if something we all know, it's like you're completely exaggerating. You're making a mountain out of a molehill, having a complete panic attack. Fear is completely, it's like, it's the taste. So all the neurotic states of mind for the Buddha are rooted in fear, which is exactly why we suffer. And it seems a bit abstract to us. But when we realize fear, when you're not in touch with reality and you've believe, we've, we've been programmed, the Buddha would say, programmed with attachment and anger and jealousy and anxiety and low self-esteem, which is why they come so automatically. But there's just this constant, if we really feel the feeling of it is constant distress, constant, and sometimes it's really strong. But we sort of take it for granted as being normal life. I mean, this is really what the Buddha's view is. And then as we lessen attachment and anger and anxiety, we become less fearful, more happy, more courageous, more empathetic. Quite literally, the Buddha's view. What do you think? Uh, yeah, thank you, then. Is that some food so to thought, I, or is it? Okay, sorry. so as you, I, I see the fear, the fear's there, but I don't really feel, I can't find a source. So no, well, that's it. That doesn't it doesn't matter. It's just it's 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 just a habit. It's a very strong habit. I mean, this seems a bit intellectual, but this is the Buddhist analysis. And as we if we're interested in studying it, we can learn to see it. That you know, um, I mean, okay, let's just use a simple example of attachment to cake. 
Attachment is this over-exaggerated um, description in our mind of the deliciousness of cake, not just that though, and the belief that when I get the cake, it'll cause me happiness. So the Buddha's telling us, and we have to look into this, that's an exaggeration. It's, a, it's an over-exaggeration of the status of the cake and of its ability to make you happy. And because we practice this attachment for so long, it's just built up. And yet again, we fall into the same trap of believing it. And every time we get the cake and then eat too much and we get disappointed, it just increases the habit of attachment. It doesn't bring satisfaction. So therefore it increases fear in a sense. It's very primordial. I'm talking at a very primordial level. The way Buddha's saying is, these are such deep habits. We don't choose to be angry. We don't sit there, I think I'll get anxious now. They're just primordial habits. And because they're, they're not rooted in reality, then this is where the fear comes from. It sounds a bit abstract. It's quite surprising to us. So it does need looking at, you know. And, and of course, there's no overt, there's no explicit object there. It's just the habit of these emotions that's so strong. I don't know. Is that something? Yes, to... thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Leanne. Talk to me. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question. Um, sometimes when I have a thought, um, usually it's a habitual thought, um, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I will feel it in my body. That's and right. at that point, I know that it's kind of too late. Okay, um, very it's, good. Already, it's already there in my body. Mm -hmm. So then what I'm trying to do is just relax my body around it and sit and just watch for it to lead. Is there anything else that I can do in that moment when it's too late? I understand. It's a really good point, Leanne. It's such a good point. Um, I think generally speaking, the point that, that, that we're making here is that because we're not, we don't have, I mean, we're learning it more and more these days, but generally speaking in our lives, we only notice it when it's too late. In other words, we only notice these things when the body is involved. And that's, the, and that's a good sign, but that's the sign of the wheels falling off. So the whole point is the Buddhist, the general idea is why you need a so-called mindfulness technique every day. You sit there training your mind to stay on the, like you decide to do five minutes of concentrating on the breath, for example, you're training your mind to stay steady. You're training your mind to not follow every crazy thought. I mean, the fact is we won't be particularly successful. We were making the effort. So then we bring to bear that skill when we open our eyes and go into the kitchen and start dealing with hubby and the kids. So whereas before you'd only notice you're getting angry when you're, the words are out the mouth when your hubby's slurping his tea yet again and you're already feeling agitated and the words come out the mouth, uh-oh, too late. So once you get a practice every day and you're training yourself not to follow every thought, you might get good concentration in your meditation, but what you're doing is learning the skill to step back. So there you are at the kitchen sink not on your cushion, and you're noticing now, you're noticing the irritation before it even gets to the body, Leanne, and that's at the conceptual level. You start to hear yourself getting, oh, look at me slurping his tea again, or the kid's not doing the right thing. You start to catch it before it even gets to the body. That's quite advanced, but that's the plan, because once it's in the body, that's the wheels falling off already. And then depending on your personality, you'll get an anxiety attack or you'll get angry. So it, it really takes time, in other words, to begin to notice all these conceptual stories be beneath the, phys the feeling level, beneath the physical level. But that's the theory and that's the plan. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Do you get my point now? I, I do. So I'll just, when the feeling comes into my body and it's too late, um, but I've recognized that I've got myself in the situation is then just relaxing around it and not thinking anymore. Well, that is about one, but my feeling is that my feeling is Leanne, if you say you notice it and you can relax around it, then it's not too late, darling. I know that for example, volatile anger, like I know my habit in my life when I was, especially as a kid, I noticed it. The moment I, I only noticed there was anger when it was vomiting out the mouth. So the fact that you can notice it and still relax around it, then it shows it's not too late because you haven't done the damage. You see there's the, the different kinds of people, you look like a more patient person. You probably wouldn't shout and yell at people. So it's not too late if you haven't vomited vomited out the mouth it's 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 up to the level of feeling it physically but it's not too late and the fact that you can relax around it, that's a pretty good sign so you're doing okay oh, okay so i'm just not putting it into action and that's good that's right darling and that's brilliant okay thank, thank you so you. much that's thank really you good. 
So just keep practicing, sweetheart. And we just, and that's the point with the Buddhist skill, this brilliant, this is really the skill that Buddha's giving us with his brilliant concentration meditation techniques invented by these Indians 3,000 years ago. They give us the ability to notice at ever deeper levels the conceptual stories that inform the feelings. We start to notice them before they get to the body. That's the goal. And eventually we can access it at that level. And then we can really do the work and change the stories. That's it's like Buddha's like the best cognitive therapist you could ever meet. Do you understand, darling? I do. Thank you so much. Good. Okay. Hello, Adriana. Talk to me. Hello. Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Oh. Please advise me. Uh, it's about the question is about two cases that happen, and I don't know what to do. The first one is. Uh, when I don't want to answer a question because I think it will start uh, no sense talking. Uh -huh. And the second case is when someone tell me you did this and I give an explanation. No, I didn't. Sorry. But in another cases, uh, almost happened that they told me, um, you, uh, I'm afraid about you. And I, I said, I know I'm a monster too, but maybe maybe yes so let's I don't look know. at the first one let's look at the and first I one feel... adriana let's do the first one first so say the first one again and then we can discuss the first one uh, i'm sorry this, say this, the this... first one again and we can discuss the first one tell me the first uh, okay and okay, uh, the first one is when i don't um, want to give an answer uh, and any question in a meeting or with a friend, because I consider that we are going to start in a no sense conversation. Okay, and so I don't well, want okay, good, 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 good. I hear that. But why don't you give me a very specific example, like a discussion with your mother, discussion with a child, a discussion with a colleague, because it can be different answers for different scenarios. So give me a simple scenario. Okay, uh, my mother last time. Uh, told me, you took my money, you took my money. And I answered, no, I didn't do that. And I explained that, but so that- Now you're describing the second problem. I want the first example the about first no example. nonsense, no no point in speaking. You said at a meeting, if someone asks me something- uh, Okay. Uh, like uh, example me, of uh, that. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, someone asked me about my daughter, and I don't want to give answers about but my who daughter. Who is this person asking you? It, the answer I give you depends upon the scenario. Uh, so okay, it friends from the high school, friends from high when I stay in high school. But the question happened uh, three, uh, I don't know, last week uh, happened that. And a person said to you, "What question?" Uh, how old is your daughter? Do you have daughters? Do you have sons? Do you have children? And how old you mean, are you? Mean they're, just they're just asking questions, general, this person is a stranger? Or is it a friend? No, it's not a friend. I only study with her in, with okay. them. So listen, darling, I mean, Adriana, it all depends. Yes. It is marvelous. It is excellent to not just want to blah, 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 blah. That's good. But sometimes if a person asks you, she just, this is what people do in conversation. How are you? Are you married? Do you have children? Then of course you can answer and be polite without giving your heart away. Now, if it's, if it's your child, going blah, 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 then it's a different answer. I mean, it, it's according to the situation, Adriana. Just being polite and answering a person's question, that's just, that's being kind to somebody. Just to be silent is being very rude. But just to talk, if you're going for dinner, six girlfriends and you're all blah, 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 gossip about the husband, gossip about the weather, gossip about the politics, then be quiet. That's wasting time. Now, the second point, if you're accused of doing something you didn't do, again, it's a question of the person. So you gave example of your mother and your mother accused you of taking her money. Is that what you said? Yes. So is your mother, yes. is your mother, is, uh, 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 that was a very serious accusation. She's accusing you of stealing her money. Is that what you're saying? No, no, I didn't know. Uh, and uh, she, at the beginning, she didn't find it. but after that. Uh, she uh, founded the money, and but uh, and what the, I'm asking the, is, the question is because mother, how Adriana, I react. 
I understand that, darling. So your mother yes. accused you of stealing her money. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, then, depending on your mother's mind, you would you simply tell her the truth. No, mama, I did not steal your money. I mean, but if, if it's somebody at work who is accusing you of doing something very serious, it's up to you to decide whether you defend yourself. Sometimes if it's something small, it is a good practice just to accept it. Oh, I'm so sorry, you know. So it depends on the situation, Adriana. There's so many examples. You can't give a simple answer. Mm. Hey, darling, thank you so much. Anybody else? Thank you. Talk? Thank you, sweetheart. Any questions from the Russians, from the Italians, from the Spanish? No? Yes, What's I think we have one here. From Russia. Okay. Yeah. What's the question from yeah. Russia? Is that Russia? It looks like Russian writing, isn't it? What is the question? The Russian man. У меня такой вопрос, как в условиях войны, в нашей стране сейчас война идет, сохранять спокойствие и ум держать свободным от омрачений, которые вызывает война, не в ненависть, осуждение и утешать людей в это время, которые страдают. Спасибо большое. So I think I think you might need to jump into the English channel then, Rubina, to to hear her um, response. I can't, click on it. I can't interpretation. Do I have to do it. She has to do it. No, I have to do it. I think if you come onto the English channel. Okay, so then go on, Diana. So, as a war in where? Which country? But there's a war in the Ukraine, I thought. Um, no, there was a war in Russia. Diana? Yes, yes. I am from Ukraine. So, the Russians are having a war with the Ukrainians, isn't it? Yes, yes, Rabbi. Yes. Well, I mean, this is a huge, no. sad, terrible suffering. It's really hard. Um, what is the man's name, Diana? Valeri, can I go? Do I have to keep in the English channel for everybody to hear me? Are you all people hearing me? They are. Okay. So, Valeri, it's a very difficult question, sweetheart. And it all depends. I mean, if you have got a Buddhist practice, do you have a Buddhist practice, Valeri? I'm just curious. I'm not saying you should have, I'm just curious. Does he, Diana? Okay, so Valeri, this is the, as we know, good. This is the, this is, yeah. Okay, darling, wonderful, Valeri. So I think this is the point, this is the big picture. This in the Buddhist view is the big picture about wisdom. And this for the world is very shocking view. This is not the view we have in the world, you know. So when we have the, if you are a practicing Buddhist and you have the big picture, you have the view of karma, which is that there are millions of sentient beings. Their consciousnesses go back and back and back and back before this life. And they go on and on and on and on after this life. Number one point. Number two point, everything we think and do and say is the process of producing the person we become and producing our future experiences. So actions we do that are driven by virtue, love and kindness can only ripen in the future as our happiness, as happy experiences. But our actions driven by anger, by fears, by jealousy, by resentment, by attachment can only ripen in the future as suffering. So if we take that basic analysis and we look at this terrible suffering of the war, the poor boys out there killing each other, 
This is due to past actions from a thousand lifetimes ago, maybe. So the point is the bigger picture in Buddhism. When you have this understanding, this informs your compassion. And you have compassion for the Russian boys. You have compassion for the Ukrainian boys. You have compassion for Mr. Putin. You have compassion for everybody because we are all in the same boat, going from life to life to life, causing suffering, experiencing suffering, causing happiness, experiencing happiness. But our tragedy is we don't have the view of karma and we all think we are just innocent victims and bad things happen and nobody knows why. I mean, this is why we suffer so badly and we keep continuing to cause terrible suffering. So it's, it's have compassion is incredible. So we and that the so we have compassion based on understanding the mind, based on seeing that people are causing themselves terrible future suffering, and realizing that this, this suffering is the result of their own past. Then we have such compassion, Valeri. And then you one you learn from it yourself and you want to give up suffering, you want to change your mind, you keep wanting to get more wisdom, you keep wanting to get more compassion, because you see the world is such a terrible place, and I must never give up. That's the attitude, Valerie. Because if you go crazy as well, we all drown together. You have to stay optimistic, you have to stay confident, and you have to use the teachings that you have to inform you to keep strong and have compassion for others and never give up. This is the attitude of the Bodhisattva. What do you think, Valeri? Thank you very much. I mean, we know life is such suffering. Life is, if it's not this war, it's another war. We know it never ends. And we learn is we must give up suffering. I must give up delusions. I must give up harming others so that the, then I can continue to practice. This is the big learning for oneself, which is the wisdom wing. And then on the basis of this, we can be compassionate and helpful to others. This is the, this is the point. Thank you, Valeri. Aliona Shevchuk. You have something to say? Do I stay, in, do I, do I stay in the English channel? Do I have to stay there? Do I, Matthew? Okay. Go, Aliona. Talk to me. Здравствуйте, спасибо за вашу лекцию. Мне просто сейчас уже показалось, что мой вопрос перекликается, скорее всего, с предыдущим. Вот так получилось. Но я, видимо, все-таки задам его. Good, please. У меня вопрос такой, что у людей, так как заявлено было тема, да, стать собственным терапевтом, э, но, скажем, частенько э, люди попадают в достаточно серьезные, скажем, такие состояния, из которых им достаточно тяжело выйти самому, и, как правило, они обращаются к психологу, который уже им, соответственно, помогает. То есть э, человек устроен так, э, что помочь ему в его, скажем, таких заблуждениях может ну, другой человек, да, вот ему самому, как правило, достаточно сложно выходить из таких состояний. Вот у меня вопрос все-таки, как в таких случаях вы можете yes, yes, yes. Рассказать, чтобы мы все-таки сами смогли себе помочь, когда находимся, да, yes, I understand. That's a really good question, Aliona. I think this is the particular skill, this is the approach in Buddhism. I think if we look in our world, more and more these days, people are learning to deal with their own minds. But we even think 50 years ago in our culture, I mean, you never went to a psychiatrist, you never went to a therapist, you'd be too ashamed, because we're not taught I mean, we're taught religion and we're taught to have good virtue and good ethics, but we're not really taught to become very familiar with our own minds. In our culture in general, we did not learn techniques. So I think that's really the skill that Buddhism is giving us. And it's been around, like I said, it's been around for 3000 years, these particular skills to learn to concentrate, which is what really mindfulness meditation is all about. Their particular skills, their psychological skills to help us learn to concentrate, which brings the ability to then pay attention to what on earth is going on in our mind. We, This is our trouble, like I said before, we are not taught that 
these more and more yes. But before in our culture, we're not taught to listen to our thoughts. The trouble is, it's only when you get angry that then you know you are angry. It's only that when you can't get out of bed that you realize you're depressed. This is the trouble, but this is the great skill that Buddhism is giving us, which has been around, like I said, for 3,000 years, to learn to be introspective. It's not mysterious. We think meditation is mysterious. We know there are thousands of thoughts in our mind every single day, but we don't pay attention. And any, and apart from not learning it, we also don't pay attention because we're too busy paying attention to the outside world, which is why we need to have some kind of practice every day where you can close your eyes and learn to focus your mind and not buy into, not not run with all the crazy thoughts. Slowly, slowly, we learn the skill to be to be more conscious. So when you, like I said before, when you open your eyes and you go to the kitchen, now you bring that skill into your daily life in the kitchen. And you're not just noticing what the kids are saying. You're not just noticing what the husband is doing, but you're noticing your own thoughts. This is the skill that we must learn more and get better and better and better at it. That's the essential job of being a Buddhist. And they're the skills that Buddha gives us. But you don't just notice what's there. When you can hear the conceptual stories before they become emotional, then you can argue with those conceptual stories. You can change your thoughts. You change your mind. That's the skill. That's the skill. Aliona, was that helpful, darling? Да, спасибо. Я правильно понимаю, что все-таки основа... Sorry, go, go, go. Sorry. Да, получается, я правильно понимаю, что основа, чтобы стать себе терапевтом, это умение концентрироваться, то есть умение медитации. То есть это база, это научиться медитировать. No, no, you don't, no, 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 there's different things. First of all, the concentration meditation, the world calls it mindfulness, is not necessarily concentrating on the mind. There is a technique to do that, but there's a more simple one first where you just learn to concentrate on anything. So you can concentrate on the breath. It's just a, you're training yourself to concentrate. But once you learn the de to develop that skill, then you can notice your thoughts in your daily life because you've trained yourself not just to be, you've trained yourself to stay focused on the breath, for example. And then you develop the skill in to listen to your thoughts. Are you hearing the point, Aliona? Or not? Or not? Does, do you understand? Does she understand? Uh... It's training yourself. Meditation, the concentration meditation, mindfulness, the very beginning, it's like a training. You're training yourself not to follow every tiny thought, which is how we spend our lives. So it's quite difficult because you, you want to rush off and think this and think that, but you just decide, I'm going to watch my breath for five minutes. And you it's like you're training yourself just to watch the breath. Your mind wanders off, you bring it back to the breath. Your mind wanders off, you bring it back to the breath. So you're training yourself to not think, every, to not uh, have a conversation with every thought. And then you look, that skill, you then bring that when you open your eyes. You, and while you're doing the dishes, you're not watching your breath, but because you've developed the skill to pay attention, you now can pay attention to what's in your mind. And then you, before it comes out the mouth, you can talk to yourself and work through it. Do you understand? Sweetheart. Aliona? Да, спасибо большое. Good. So, Victoria or Matthew, we have one more question. Ross has a question. Should we do that? Yes. Wonderful. Ross, talk to me, darling. Well, hi. Um, hi. Thanks so much. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm doing some volunteering for an FPMT center, uh, uh -huh. working on digital stuff and website pieces. Wonderful. Yeah. And Things at the center didn't go well, um, and oh, they yeah. rectorless and had all sorts of difficulties. Yeah. And so the volunteerism kind of evolved into this toxic space where my phone was ringing at three o'clock in the morning and people weren't responding to email. It was just horribly disrespectful. I'm so sad about that, Ross. The board. And so I have this relationship that I've had with this nun for 20 years. 
Um, I love her to pieces. She's a wonderful, wonderful teacher, but I feel mad. And like that if, the, if it was anybody else, I would put him into the don't talk to that person again, they're toxic. But mm -hmm. a member of the Sangha, so I hesitate and I, um, uh, and I just don't know how to resolve it and move forward and let it go. Um, I, understand, I, I understand, Ross. I understand. I mean, the trouble is it's now, you know, it's past our time. And I'd really, I'd love you to have a discussion with that. Do you want to talk to me personally about this? And we can, we can have a little discussion. Would I'd love like to, to talk to you. Well, why, don't you, why don't you email me, Ross? It'd be the best, I think. I mean, it's a, it's a topic that's very typical for everybody, but I'd love to be able to help you in more depth. So why don't you email me? My name, Rabina Corton, or one word, at Mac, like the computer, at Mac.com. I'd love to discuss it with you. How about that? What do you think? Thank you so much. I will email you right now. Robina Corton at Mac.com. Good, Ross. Thank you. thank you, darling. So you thank bet. you, Victoria. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Renner. We've been absolutely blown away with your kindness and thank answering you. all of our questions. Thank I've learned you, so Rubina. much. Thank Good you so darling. much. And thank you. Join thank us you for our everybody. next uh, Wisdom so the is, series in April. Yeah, and so keep thank moving, you. everybody, and never give up is the key to success. Keep moving, watching your mind, seeing your mind, and then getting wisdom and then helping others. That's the progress. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Okay. Thank you, darling, so much. Thank you so much, Rubina. Bye. Thank you.